episode of Pablo Held Investigates. In today's episode, I talk to the great Gil Goldstein. If you have seen other episodes of this podcast, you know that I'm a fan of the people that I talk to and uh, a little bit of a nerd. And sometimes those nerds, uh, they need to connect to other nerds and fans. And Gil and me, we share a deep affinity to Gil Evans' music. Gil Goldstein had the pleasure and the privilege to, to really work with Gil Evans and, and study with him, actually. So we really go into depth um, about how that was like for him and what he got out of it, which is just incredible for me because I actually reached out to Gil Goldstein through the great Mike Gibbs, another great composer and arranger. And I always used to ask Mike, for new sheets or handwritten sheets by Gil Evans. Do you have this sheet? Do you have this sheet? And he would always say, let me talk to Gil Goldstein. You know, I, I've been a fan of Gil's music and his work with Mike Brecker and Milton Nascimento, uh, Wallace Roney, many other people for a long time. But, you know, through Mike, I had this connection to Gil. Mike was kind enough to put us in touch. And then we had a beautiful conversation. He talked about his work and love for Gil Evans' music, but also we talked about his deep relationship with Mike Brecker and his work on albums by Wallace Roney um, and uh, Milton Nascimento. It was a pleasure to talk to him and I'm very thankful for him for his contribution. If you would like to support this podcast, join me on patreon.com slash Pablo Held and become a patron. It helps me to continue this series big time. Also, you can subscribe to this channel, give me a comment and I will read it and, and try to comment to your comment as well. A nice companion to this podcast is this little notebook. I've put this out on my Bandcamp page. It's the Investigation Notes notebook and it has staff paper. You can write down all your favorite things in it, maybe even some quotes from, from this podcast. I hope you enjoy this episode and thanks for watching. Are we, are we, is this the beginning of the interview? We're in it. Oh, we're in it? Yeah. All right, let me get nervous. Hold on. <laughs> Hold Man, on. you have been doing this for so long. You, don't, you, shouldn't, be, you shouldn't be nervous. And also, you've been doing interviews yourself. I've been doing interviews myself. With who? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But I did those on the telephone. Oh, yeah? N none of them were in person? Uh, um, well, maybe Bill Evans was in person mm. and Swallow. But, you know, it was in the days when I had a cassette tape recorder mm -hmm. and I would record the person and then I would transcribe it at home. Right. You know, and it was... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not really. I'm not. I didn't think of myself as a great in, interviewer. And and uh, and Chick Corea said to me when we were doing it, he said, "Hey man, you got to ask me some questions. You know, you don't, <laughs> don't just let me." <laughs> and I went, "Well, you know, just say whatever you want to say." You That's know, it? I said, "I'm I'm not really an interviewer. I'm not a prodder." Yeah. You know who's who's also you're fantastic from your. I watch your. Um, investigations also oh, is you. great is um leo sidron you know his yeah, uh, yeah. podcast i know it yeah. you know his father yeah, yeah. Ben, Sid ben sidron he is a really he's so like he's really an interviewer you mm. know he finds the thread when you say and he said now that reminds me you ever yeah he, yeah yeah he takes you along. He's like a, a, a great conductor, mm -hmm. you know, you know, it's like, okay, we're going that way and it's a good direction. Right. So, um, so he, anyway, getting back to, sorry, go ahead. I was just thinking that Ben Sidron also did a nice interview. His, so his father, yeah. Ben Sidron did a nice interview with uh, Miles. With Miles. Yeah. I don't know that one, but I know the one he did with Gil. Oh, Evans. I don't know that one. It's great. It's great. And also with Mike Brecker, he did a beautiful interview. Mm. I have to look up the one he did with Miles. But the thing is, don't you think that we as musicians, and especially you've been learning from, from so many great musicians, like when we speak about Gil, in a way you, you were, I'm, 
I suppose you were a great interviewer with him as well because you you have certain things that you want to know from somebody and you ask those specific questions so you get you get what you're looking for maybe and something else on top you know I have regrets with Gil that I didn't ask enough you know mm. honestly you know it's like god I should have asked that you know yeah. but and uh, uh, Anita Evans Gil's widow said once that Jocko started calling him, you know, before he, you know, was Jocko, you know, he was in Florida and hanging out. And uh, he said he would call Gil and he would make Gil angry because he would ask questions that Gil really couldn't answer. It was so <laughs> it was so at the heart of what was happening that mm. Gil went, I don't want to talk to him anymore. He, oh, he'd make wow. Me But, you know, as, as not in a mean way, yeah. you know, it was just like it was too thorough. His question, he was like, I wish I knew what those questions were. Yeah, me you too. The, you know, if you know the right question, you're uh, you're going to learn a lot of stuff. <laughs> I'm always amazed with my students that they like really don't go to the right question. You know, I go now this would be the time that they would ask this yeah. and they go, no, they don't do yeah. it. And I said. You know what? I'm going to wait. I don't want to prod you because you didn't even think of the question. You're obviously not ready for the answer. <laughs> right. Right. It's like you'll take some time. Yeah. But I mean, I mean of, of course, it's always a topic related. But what would you say is the, the quality of a great question? The quality of a great question. What does it you know, take for somebody to ask a great question? I, to me, it always seems like there's a, you know, a question that is kind of dangling in the air that, you know, would would uh, elucidate the truth about a subject. Mm. And it seems like sometimes people are, I see it, but I don't even want to know the answer because I'm work. afraid of it. It need, means work and you have to do work to when you ask the question, then it's your responsibility Then mm. it's, you know, and then they go, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah you know, <laughs> and maybe I was like that with Gil too, at the point that I, I knew him because I was hardly even, uh, I was, I was not an arranger at that point at, in any sense of arranging, you know, mm. I went to his house a couple times and I remember, you know, aside from working with him, which was most of my lessons, just hearing what he said, I went to his, his house a couple times and I had written a piece for the band, uh, the Gil Evans Orchestra at that time. Mm -hmm. And I played it for him at the piano. He said, that sounds good. Now all you have to do is orchestrate it. And I went, oh yeah. <laughs> and that, you know, and, and then I realized, like, I don't really know how to do that. Mm. Honestly, you know, I went, I, I just saw the big blank of like, oh, yeah, that's right. That's all I have to do. Mm. You know, it was so simple, but I went, I, I don't know the how to do that. So then I started to try to learn how to orchestrate and raid from him. Well, you know, from him in the sense that I got to get to all of his written notes and then he would play me that he thought were interesting to listen to. And I went, wow, this is great. You know, I'm having Gil Evans play the pieces that he thinks are things that I should listen to. Like what do you remember? Do you remember? One of the pieces was... Um, Ella Speed. No, 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 no. It was uh, it was called Nobody's Heart, and it's right. on his first record. Gil Evans and Ten. Do you know that? Yeah, Gil Evans plus Ten. Yeah, and or Big Stuff. It was right, also yeah. released. And I I listened to it in his apartment, and then I he showed me his sketch of it which I'd be happy to send you if you want to learn. To me, it has everything you need to know about Gil Evan on two pages, you know, mm. two and a half pages. It was, you know, he would write like a sketch and the, 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 you know, it starts with two 
whole steps, and it's like E minor and C7, but it's only two notes, you know? Right. And then there's this real low E, and then there's this high, you know, this mm -hmm. piano up top. So it's like, you know, he's exposed the whole register, and you can You'd have no idea how many instruments that is. To huh. me, it sounded like 14 instruments. Yeah. You know, I didn't know what it was, honestly. Mm. What instru I didn't know what instruments were playing that and uh, that and, you know, I knew the interval, but it didn't it didn't click on like how brilliant it was. And then the melody sneaks in under the. You know, and it's like it's in its own little register, and you go, that's the melody. There yeah. it is. You know, and it's so clear, and then it just it just goes, you know. Mm. And so, you know, that was something that I loved. And then another one was, come to think of it, Ella Speed from the same record. Yeah. Which was a, a solo that he, it was a solo of Lead Bellies that he just transcribed and it's very simple it's like you know it's mm. a, like a simple blues melody but the way he <laughs> voiced it is like seriously you know i mean it becomes you know and i think it was yeah six horns or six horns and it's it it sounds like you know, a, a river. You right. Know? <laughs> it always transcends uh, the the instrumentation somehow. He chooses yeah. something, and then it becomes. He, his combinations always become something you can't really identify the instruments, as you said before. It becomes a new right. texture, a new. new one thing. and one equals a new thing. Yeah. Mm. And then uh, another thing that I learned that was a a kind of a regret for a while that he said to me. You know, Gil would kind of talk like this. He'd go, "Wow, I wrote I wrote the other day a voicing for soprano, flute, and trumpet, and I forgot what he said. What was on top? What was huh. on the middle? And what was on the bottom? And he said, "Man, that sounded beautiful. It sounded so big and fresh." And then I went, "Wow!" But I didn't write it down. And huh. then I left, and I went. What did he say? But then I realized he experimented. He was thinking, huh, how about if I put the flute on the bottom and the soprano in the mid, uh, the trumpet second, and then the soprano? And he was thinking that could really be a nice combination of overtones. Mm -hmm. You know, so I went, the important thing is that you don't think about standard ways of grouping instruments together mm -hmm. so i kind of learned that you can almost do anything that your head can try to imagine if you're if you're you know paying attention to, and you know what those instruments sound like in their individual registers you know it uh, should work yeah <laughs> and uh Wow, I I heard that uh, Miss Yang well, said that was a good uh, good lesson learned. Yep. Yeah, I heard that that just reminded me. It just reminded me what you said. It's like Miss Yang said, you can do anything as long as you can justify it in a logical way. I agree. You know, mm. and it, even better if you can justify it intuitively. Like, yeah, I just I just heard it. I just thought that would be a great combination yeah. or a great combination of notes. Then you can really never be wrong. You yeah, know, that becomes you, the new logic true. then. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're, you're intuitive and you're, you know, you have a, a general knowledge of music and, you know, you're, you know, it's, uh, but, you know, Gil could write voicings that were like so low, you know, mm. You know, he was like, I think even in, uh, whatchamacallit, in Nobody's Heart. 
that's one of the last chords of the song. Yeah. It's like an F sharp minor and there's a and it's pretty much in that register. I don't know. It might even be there. No, it's in the other one. Yeah. But it's like, you know, and nobody should be able to do that. But he went, I can make that work, you know. Yeah, with the right instrumentation. Right instrumentation. Mm. Also the right players. Sure. You know, he was he was writing for everybody he knew and he knew what you know barbers you know that note sounded like and he knew he would play it you know with the right finesse did you, you know? talk to gil uh, about uh, billy strayhorn no i know he i would he'd mentioned duke ellington many times uh -huh. <laughs> in a very funny way though he said Wow, I learned so much from Duke Ellington. He says he d he did drop two voicings. <laughs> <laughs> really, really, that came out of Gil that, Evans. That was mouth. his essence of yeah, Duke Ellington's you know, music. Drop two voicings. I went. How could I? Wouldn't even have thought Gil would have ever heard. I thought that was like a Berkeley thing. That right. Gil would have like laughed at and gone, "Give me a break." Yeah. Bro. But, you know, but no, we never talked about um, Billy Strayhorn. I just read about, uh, um, yeah, Gil Evans saying about Billy Strayhorn, like whenever he, the first time he heard um, Billy Strayhorn's arrangement of Chelsea Bridge for the Duke Ellington Orchestra, he was trying to come close to that ever, ever since. Like really? all, he, all he did was trying to come close to that. I'm going to listen to that today. Yeah. It's a special, special vibe, and when when you listen to it through that, uh, you know, yeah. perspective, it gives you another. I bet Gil would. Gil, the first time I saw Gil, he was sitting at this big table, sorting through thousands of pages of parts. Like, wait a minute, that's the second page of the trumpet. Oh wow! Yeah, it was like it was like oh man. Can we help this guy? You know, uh -huh. it looked like it looked overwhelmingly like confusing. And then he would end up passing out like concert scores to the horn players. Hmm. And he and then the, one of the horn players says, "Hey, Gil, what are we supposed to play on here?" And Gil said, "Pick a line and follow it." <laughs> <laughs> you know. And I went, "I love this guy." Mm -hmm. You know. I always, I always thought like Gil Evans would be this really studious, mm. uptight guy that would say like, "Guys, please, you know that phrase, da 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 da," you know. And he was, <laughs> he was so, he was into, you know. So we're about to do the concert, which we, I don't think we ever played through one song, you know. It was like, you know, that was the rehearsal, and I was like. Wow, this is going to be interesting, you know. Mm. And so they go, ladies and gentlemen, Gil Evans. Nothing. He's no Gills doesn't come out. We're all sitting there at our instruments, and it's like two minutes, three minutes. I'm going to say it was about four minutes. Wow. That we're just standing there, and I went, oh man, what happened? You know, I hope he's all right. And then all of a sudden, he just walks on the stage going like this. Like, <laughs> and I went, this is going to be great. This is going to be great. He's so loose, yeah. you know. He's so loose. And he didn't even call a tune. He just starts playing like kind of an F. And we knew, well, we had that tune that was an F. Mm -hmm. You know, so it must be that tune. You know, it was like... You know, it was very kind of what the way I think of Gil, you know, that he liked everybody to discover the piece. And, you know, wow. he, you know, Gil comes from uh, he always said also to me, he goes, I, you know, I learned how to arrange from listening to um, Louis Armstrong and his early groups. And he goes, and in every song, there's a moment of magic. You know, mm. and I went, wow, you know, he that's what he heard. And so he would transcribe those pieces, which were not really arrangements. They were improvisation. Sure. Yeah. But he looked at that. At, that's an arrangement. 
So he always looked at, at, you know, you can create an arrangement if you have a good band and good players. And I know you're interested in, um, you know, Fees of Kilimanjaro and all those projects that he did Hmm. with Miles, you know, and he was, he was the producer, no matter who got a credit on the record as producer, it was Gil and Gil would supply these little sketches that everybody, it was enough impetus to make everyone collaborate on the arrangement and to create it. And for me, that's an arrangement, you know, Mm. even if he didn't write every note of the arrangement, he made it, he made it open. He he presented just enough for everybody to say, I see what you mean, Mm. you know, and he, he made them do it and he, he allowed them to do it, you know, even miles, you know, I think he encouraged miles just, just play. You know, it was like, you know, I think he encouraged Miles to go kind of freer than Miles had been, wouldn't have maybe come into his head to do mm. exactly. I think Gil was the co-conspirator on those things. Wow. And, and um, Did he talk about Miles to you? Did he talk about Miles? You know, he would just say the obvious, you know, he was a great singer of song, you know, and I would just write, to, try to write something that, you know, would support him, you know, mm-hmm. but he was a sound innovator. You know, most of the things that it's already in print that he said about Miles, you know, yeah, it was not, um, when I got to do the project with Miles and Quincy, where we and Quincy live, Quincy and Miles at Montreal. That was hilarious because Quincy called me because he called Anita Evans, and Quincy's Anita said, "Gill's the concert master of the band now." But Gill wanted Gill Goldstein to be the concert master, mm. so Gill can transcribe, get, recreate the music. She recommended me, mm-hmm. and Quincy called me and. I had about a month and a half to do it from wow. sketches, you know, and I was I was guessing a lot. <laughs> but um, I got to hang with Miles. That's the only time I met Miles, that short period. And, you know, Miles would just say such great things about Gil, you know, like he'd be listening to the band. He goes, wow, no, not from now, it's Miles. Mark Gil's like, he goes. Nobody will write like that again. Mm. You know, he was like, listen to that. Yeah. That guy could write, man. That's a shit. <laughs> so, you know, I got to hear his love of Gil, you know. And yeah. That was nice to uh, experience. But, but now, I mean, because I wanted to talk to you about that project, huh? but now I was surprised to hear that you tried to to recreate it from from scratch didn't you have the the no 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 i did it from gills gill had oh, you had you know okay. sketches oh yeah 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 no, i did but but you know some and the sketches you know would be like a usually a piano sketch like a piano reduction of the orchestra yeah. and then the melody above yeah. it you would usually have miles's melody as a separate line yeah and um but sometimes it would say brass you know and you could kind of know what it was except for certain things like the beginning of the duke you know Mm. i was like what instruments are those yes you know (laughs) so (laughs) and i really couldn't figure it out and then i luckily saw a video of them doing it right and everybody stood up and i went okay there's trumpet you know i went okay that's it yeah turn off the sound just look (laughs) yeah i'm just gonna look at that you know and then when i went to uh um I brought the music to Miles's house, which was very funny because when we were, when I was writing it out, we would rehearse it 
with a New York band and have like, you know, different trumpet players pro- play it like Tim Hagen's. I remember played it once. Mm-hmm. And then, so Tim Hagen's when we start would play, you know, you know, Miles's part. And so, um, you know, I was thinking, wow, you know, that's hard music. Mm. And we really have to uh, get Miles in here to rehearse or to at least look at the music before we go to Montro, you know. I just, so I, I called up Quincy, you know. Mm-hmm. At that point, we were best friends after two phone calls. And I said, hey, Quincy, you know, we've got to really get Miles to come in and try to rehearse in New York. And he goes, that's a good idea. He says, uh, here's his number, call him up. You know, so <laughs> I I take, I call him up and I go, and somebody answered the phone, like a guy, like, and then I go, Hey, excuse me, is Miles there, please? He goes, who is it? I said, it's Gil Goldstein. And he said, hold on a second. He goes, Miles, it's Gil, Gil, Gil Goldstein on the phone for you. And Miles comes to the phone. He goes, yeah, Gil, what's up? Hi, Gil. You know, and I don't think he would have said my name if it wasn't Gil. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was like, Gil is calling. And he just said, hi, Gil. Mm. And I went, he called me Gil. That's yeah. such a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was like, wow, thank you. You know, so anyway, we had this kind of funny conversation on the phone and in, in the long short story is he hung up on me because <laughs> <laughs> I said something that wasn't to his liking. It had nothing to do with anything that I really said, but it was just a situation that I can't really share. But he went, <laughs> and, then, and then I went, wow, Miles hung up on me. That's so flattering. Mm. You know, it just seems so cool to have him hang up. So I said, I'll call him back and ask him if he wants me to bring the music anyway. So I said, hey, Miles, it's Gil again. I said, but you, should I bring you the music? He goes, oh, yeah. Went, All right. So um, I said, he, he was trying to tell me his address, which I couldn't understand at all. He was like, I'm at 275 Santa Barbara. <laughs> you know, I was like, I said, excuse me, sorry, can you tell me? I, you know, I guess I could have called Quincy and found out his address, yeah. but I just uh, I made him say it four times until he <laughs> an angry. And then I went over there, and he was just very, he was friendly. I was like, I was Gil. I was yeah. enough Gil that he could be totally relaxed with me. And he, there was a woman over there, and he goes. That's Gil. He's got the band in Montreux. Okay, wow. yeah. Okay. It's my band. And uh, so, you know, but then he looked at um, the Duke and he goes, he says, man, I was playing flugelhorn on that. Mm-hmm. And it sounded like a flute. You get it? Flugelhorn. <laughs> You know, he he was like making jokes with me, you know, and I went, yeah, flute go home, Mm -hmm. yeah. But it was so high, he was playing that high B on Mm -hmm. the flute. Mm -hmm. It was a flute go home. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, I, I felt very relaxed, you know, over there. And then when we went to the gig, it was another comedy of weird stuff because we rehearsed but miles didn't come to the rehearsal during the day he chose not to come (laughs) so and that's when wallace roney was in george grunts's band and quincy said you know we should get somebody to play miles's part so he said why don't you go back and ask benny bailey to play Mm -hmm. and and so I walk in the back there and I said, hey, Benny, would you play? Uh, and then he goes, no, I don't want to do that. No, thank you. you know? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, Wallace just appeared. He mm. wasn't even playing in the section. He goes, Gil, I'll play it. And I went, oh, my God, what are you doing here? You know, 
and you know he was in George Gruntz's big band. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so he just went up there with Kenny Garrett, and he was, you know, he played it, and it was like he knew that music. Yeah, he knew cold, it. Cold, you mm-hmm. know. Yeah, it was like, <laughs> and then um, there are some spots in that music where I really, honestly, don't know for sure, but Gil kind of. In the chart that I have, Gil wrote a solo for Miles. I think it was in uh, maybe even I don't honestly remember, but there was one one of the arrangements where Miles' solo was written out. Now, did Gil transcribe it and write it after Miles played it? I'm not really sure, but it sounded like he wanted Miles to play a specific thing to fit into the backgrounds he wrote. I think I think um, I think in one of the tracks on Miles Ahead, there's a Miles is playing a solo of uh, of Ahmad Jamal's guitar player. Oh, okay, from so, that new rumba song. Yeah, I think so. So uh, you know, it's very possible. Uh, It sounded uh, because when I found out the original recording by Ahmad Jamal and his trio, it sounded like, oh, I, I know this melody. What the what the guitar player is playing? Well, it's and, like Gil did with the the Lightning Hopkins. Uh, was it Lightning Hopkins? Uh, uh, Ella Speed, right? Yeah, uh, where he wrote the solo. So it's something that Gil did. And if yeah, if you are you talking about the Ahmad Jamal thing? The new chamber orchestra or something. I'm t- yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And it always freaks me out that Gill's arrangement sounds exactly like that piece. You know, he right. totally transmuted it like perfectly. You know, yeah. it's like just like a a little bigger. But yeah. it's like That's the piece. That is, he nailed it. You know how how important is transcription for you? Transcription. Well, you know, I you have to learn, know the songs, and uh, you know, I ha- you know, I I use this program that I started to use when I did Mike Brecker's record, um, Wide Angles, because Mike would give me like demos of the songs I had to arrange that he played into. Uh, logic and so I couldn't hear it as fast as he played it you know but I had a score but it was a I mean it's a logic notation Mm -hmm. which was kind of a mess you know it looked like you know I couldn't I couldn't tell so I had to slow the songs down so I started to use transcribe apostrophe it's a it's a slow downer and it works great you know you can change the key so I use that all the time, mm. you know, to, you know, whenever I, I, whenever I arrange, I feel like I have to learn a song pretty clearly and I can really only learn it if I listen at like 50 or 75%. Otherwise I'm like going, what, the heck? you yep. know, but if it's, if I write it, If I slow it down enough, I can almost write it as fast as, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes even 30, I can get, da, 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 you yeah. know, so I guess I'm waiting for the software, the transcribe. <laughs> no, I mean, I, and, you know, Gil said that was his biggest skill, transcribing. Mm. You know, that's how he learned how to arrange. He was a, a transcriber and. I forgot once he said, I have to transcribe this thing that I have to write out. And I said, I can help. I could help you if you want, Gil. And he goes, I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> I said, of course you can. What could I try to? Yep. So, yeah, I love to I love to be able to transcribe. Um, <laughs> I want to I want to get back to uh, to your relationship with Michael Brecker, you know, Leading up to this, I was listening, going back to Wide Angles a lot, you know, because that's one of my favorite records by by oh, Michael. Thank you. And uh, the the colors you find there um, are so unique and so it's hard to put into words. But 
uh, I, I know exactly which which uh, uh, shop I bought it in right when it oh. came out, and I've been listening to it for so long. Oh, it's an important you. record for me. Thank but you. I hadn't listened to it in maybe a year, two years. So going back to it and listening to it a couple of days in a row and finding new things in it was really special. And the first thought is was um, which I hadn't really realized before, but it's a big band. It's it's a bigger band, but the trumpet is almost always in mute, and it's. Is it? I mean, it, it creates a certain texture with like the trumpet. Usually in in these bigger right. ensembles, is I hate that. It's yeah. yeah it's yeah. It's it's <laughs> usually in front. You know, it's usually yeah. leading the sections or you right, know right, first right, trumpet right. or whatever. Right. Even if it's a chamber like orchestra situation like this, but here it seems like the 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 woodwinds and the and also the the string quartet are are, le are leading the thing, and this right. <laughs> Alex Sipiagin with his trumpet plays in mute most of the time and sounds like a, a very a very yeah. very good afterthought of the sound. <laughs> like oh right. yeah, there's something. There's another texture there. Well. You know, or he played flugelhorn, I guess, a lot too. Yeah, I only remember him playing in mute on uh, Timbuktu, but he might have played. Oh, mute it's, on... it's on the first song for sure, also. Oh, and uh, that's right, and right, right. Um, um, Rock band. Rock band, right? How el elaborate were the demos that Mike sent you? You know, they 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 would be like the tune you know it would be like if it was uh, timbuktu it would be you know bum bum dun 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 you know it was no intro yeah. no blowing no ending it was like you know a minute and 30 seconds he would play usually the melody usually on soprano and he had a really good drum thing he could do Because he played drums, mm. and so the demos sounded really good. And then most of the arrangement was, you know, in the piano. He had like a piano part, you know. So yeah. that was kind of the tune. He had a usually a specific bass line, you know, that he had composed, and then. Uh, you know, obviously, all the chords and kind of the voicings are from Mike. You know, mm -hmm. it's not they're they're his tunes, and I just tried to make it sound clearer. But I tried to really make it sound exactly what his chords were, which was very hard to tell because they were. Mike said to me once, he said, "Gil, I think there's a wrong note." in one of these chords and he goes he goes you know my chords are um i forgot what he said but he said they're a little bit uh sketchy already and if you have one note wrong you know it's a mess you yeah. know it really had to be with that little tension there and i went okay i'll go back and listen to that so you know he knew exactly when it was right or not right And sometimes I tense him up a little bit, but he liked his original voice, uh, the sound of the chord, and I had to find what made the chord unique. Right. And they were all kind of unusual chords for me to learn and to figure out, and then I could, you know, voice lead from there. Did he explain his harmonic concept or... or no. Uh, a little bit to you? No? I mean, you know, Mike was just, he he found a good process with uh, um, logic that he could, you know, either play chords first and then come up with a bass line and then come up with a melody. But he kind of created things in logic. I don't know, honestly, if he made sketches But here's a here's a kind of a, another funny story about that, because years before I worked with Mike, I would see him at parties or something, or see him in some in, um, environment at Seventh Avenue South, and I'd always you know try to talk to him, 
I mean, hello, Mr. Brecker. You know, I was always like, you know, I want to have some way to talk to him. So on one day at this party at James Farber, the engineer's house, I think it was there. And he's standing in a kitchen and I walk in there and he's kind of saying how he feels like he can't write. Huh. And he's studying with this guy that Richie Byrack studied with. And, you know, he's given him exercises to write. And I went, oh, man. I said, that's kind of hard for me to understand, Mike, honestly. Because, I mean, everything you play is kind of a unique melody. And I think, like, you know, you could just play something and that's kind of the song. And he goes, I said, why don't you just turn on the tape recorder and play into it. And, you know, I'm sure you'll find a million melodic ideas and then you could build from that. And he was very sarcastic. He goes, oh, turn on the tape recorder, play something. You got a tune. <laughs> but he said it like a joke, yeah. you know, and I went, you know, I was just trying to help, you know, I didn't take offense at it, but yeah. he just like went, yeah, right. Yeah. So he, so he's telling me how he wrote Brexterity and mm -hmm. he goes, Bill, you're not going to believe it, but Brexterity, I just, I turned on logic and I went, and I just played the melody and then I came up with some little chords, and that was the tune. And, I, and that's such I a like, playful right. tune. That's so true. Right. I mean, that's so. And he just it makes he sense. just improvised it. You know, he improvised the melody. Yeah. And so, so yes, his demos did sound very much like the head of the tune. You know, mm. and I had to try to orchestrate it and add things in that kept the the integrity of the tune but that i could add some things into it you know mm -hmm. and then i had to create blowing sections because none of them had blowing sections you know? oh so you decided on when there when there was sort of on which well, chord sections that you would yeah oh okay yeah because the tune would be over on the demo and then it would be you know empty yeah. so i had to say okay now the solo is going to be And then I'd have to think about what it was. So now on broadband, where it's that long form, I created chords that kind of come from the from the tune itself. But at some point, I was composing chords, you know, and you know, chord, you know, E flat over E and F, you know, like kind of chords that I thought came from Mike's vocabulary. Mm. So I did and I also did that on Angle of Repose. I created the solo section and the ending. That's the ballad, you know? right? Da, yeah. Da, 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 yeah. Right. Okay, But it yeah. just ended on the demo that I had and there was what do we play? What is one play on? So I wrote those chords, you know, it starts with like G, G minor, da, and then some other chord that I don't remember. So it just kept going, and I wrote, and Mike kept saying, really, it's hard, and I, I don't even know that I can play over these. And I went, Mike, of course you can play over them. He goes, <laughs> I don't know. They're really, it's really complicated to play over that. And I, I was just like listening to him going, the recording sessions in three or four days. <laughs> And I'm not going to write that arrangement over, you know? So I went, all right. Yeah, I hear you. I said, well, let me, I'll look at it and see if I can, you know, like simplify them or something. And, I, you know, I, and meanwhile, you know, he, he played the daylights out of it from yeah. the, in the beginning, you know, and it was like, and then he also said on Brexterity, which he played, he goes, I'm never going to be able to go. Da, 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 da. Mm. I went, really? <laughs> you played it, you know, when you wrote it, you know? Yeah. And he never, ever, like, made it seem like, well, that's hard to play, you know, just like. Da, 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 da. You know? Yeah. You'll never be able to play it. 
And then on the song um, that Adam uh, Rogers soloed on, which is called, um, it's a Don Grolnick tune. That's the one Don Grolnick, Evening Faces. Yeah. That was, I transcribed, he found it. Uh, he found a dat of Don Grolnick. And he said, man, I always wanted to do this tune. It's like a really cool tune. And Don is playing it on the on the tape. And he goes, this is a song previously titled Evening Faces. Hmm. <laughs> previously titled. And so he played the song. And I just tried to, again, transcribe it as best I could to make it sound like the song. But the changes were a little bit hard. But I also created a blowing section based on the tune, you know, that had a two four bar in it. And, mm. You know, it was pretty much the changes with some backgrounds. And then he said to Adam, he goes, Adam, have you been practicing the um, the the changes for that tune? And he goes, Oh yeah. He said I put it in my computer and I've been playing along with it for about three weeks. And he went. That's it. I, I screwed up. You know, I didn't practice them at all. And uh, man, it's going to be it's going to be a drag. I don't mm. know if I can play through them. <laughs> I went, well, I'll we'll have to get somebody else probably. Mm. You know, so, you know, that was Mike, just very humble and, you know, and uh, self-effacing, you know. Yeah, where does this come from? I mean... Uh, with an uh, ability and talent like that, and uh, obviously maybe that's where it comes from. Huh. You know, he's so he's so he's so uh, you know like self-effacing that he always wants to make sure that it's the best it can be. You know, and so he's really kind of tense and worried, and then he does better. You know. Mm -hmm. You know, he's like, it's not like, ah, that's easy for me. I can I'll nail it. You know, big deal. You know. Yeah. He's, he's like, I gotta, I gotta do good. And when we did the video in uh, Japan, it was going to be filmed. Yeah. And, you know, we had some little spots in the shows where it was like a little confusing, you know, the ending of this song. And so Mike said, Gil, I really got, we got to talk because there's a couple spots We really have to go over, you know, the ending. It has to be really in time. Some people are retarding and let's not do that. It's like, da, ba, da, ba, booga, you know, I feel it like, you know, and uh, so he got kind of nervous and like, okay, Gil, you know, we got to correct this stuff. Mm. And I went, all right, let's, let's find the spot. So he was a little more nervous and that made it a better concert, you know, <laughs> Because we were, we were on our P's and Q's, and I said, "Guys, we got to not slow down here," you mm. know. And uh, so that was just uh, part of Mike's thing. That you know, I mean, I think Pat Metheny is also like that too. He's like every record has got to be great, and he doesn't want to flag anything. How does know? that affect your your vibe? Well, I, I like to be around somebody that wants something to be good. You know, Mike is not the least bit mean, you know. He didn't say, you know, <laughs> this this is fun. This is a funny story, too, because we, I hate to say, but one of the last gigs we did the Quindectet was at the Hollywood Bowl when Mike had become sick. And uh, it was the last Quindectet gig, I think. And um, he was very nervous at the Hollywood Bowl. They say, okay, you've got 45 minutes. And if you don't finish, they just spin you off. They wow. spin the stage, yeah. So it was Dave Holland's big band and maybe Joe Zalanoff, a band of his. And we were the first, we were the opening act, And uh, I think. And Mike was like, guys, we have to, it has to be 50 minutes, yeah. you know? So we're, the last song of the set was It's Been Real. So I pick up my accordion 
and I start to play and I kind of put my head down and my eyes are closed and I'm kind of going on a little long, you know? <laughs> and so Mike was getting nervous. We're going to get spun off. So he, he made a sign to the first violinist that was sitting next to me. He went, Tap, you know, poke him. <laughs> so he can open his eyes and, uh, you know, I can say, you know, come on, you know, and let, you know, he's going to put us into overtime, but she didn't do it. And then the next day when we were leaving, he goes, Gil, I'm sorry, man, but you, you really got to kind of keep your eyes open if you're conducting. And, you know, I, I was having a hard time communicating with him. He goes, but then again, I like the fact that you kind of get lost in the music. That's fine. Uh. <laughs> he said, it's great. Yeah, keep uh, You're going to do that. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be fine. That's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> and then, actually, Dave Holland did get spun off. No. After us, yeah. And it was so stupid because it was in the drum solo, and you knew the song was going to be over yeah. in two minutes, you know. And then they just... <laughs> well, the powers that be. The powers that be go, it's too long. Yep. We're going to spin them off. And then the band just spins off, and then you finish, and you're in backstage. And the audience goes like... Yeah. No. What happened? <laughs> yeah. But, but Mike really didn't want to do that. So anyway, so that was another Mike story. And then... Uh, yeah. How uh, do you think your time with Gil Evans has informed um, that particular record? Oh, I, I mean, I would have never had any any idea how to do something like that. I really, and it's to me, it's it's all informed by Gil Evans. Mm. Everything is is Gil Evans as much as I could, you know. <laughs> Today I went back. Like, I have a feeling, was Gil also involved in one of my other favorite records? You know, this one, the oh, ballad, yeah, yeah, ballad yeah, yeah, book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and then I looked at the book and, the yeah, you, you were involved with that too. So, and, and then it says music preparation. But also, you did some arrangements of some of the songs. And I'm wondering, yeah, what was that process like? And that was... That was a funny process because it was the first record that I did with Mike that really was a, you know, part of the record with Mike. And I think Pat hired me. He said, we really need somebody to keep all the charts. And then I went, all right. And he said, we might need a couple arrangements too. And I went, okay. And they wanted uh, my ship, which I, I said, oh, you know what I could do is uh, I could reduce Gill's arrangement for, you know, a quintet. Yeah. And Pat went, that's exactly what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like, that's what you're going to do. And then uh, my proudest moment on that record was they were, they, um, Mike called me up and they said, James is going to do a standard. We went to visit him and he would like to do the nearness of you. And I said to Mike, which was totally true. I said, Mike, I've had that song in my head for the last two years. I can't stop thinking of that song. Every time I think, what am I thinking? It was like, you know, boo -doo 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 -dee. Mm. and he goes, you're kidding, right? I said, no, I'm serious. So I said, cool, you know. So I, I started to do an arrange arrangement. You know, I wanted to think of some chords thinking of James Taylor and Pat and Mike and Herbie, you know, how they would play the nearness of you. That wasn't just a ballad. Yeah. And so we got together like two or three times with Pat, me and Mike, and we'd play through all the songs. You know, I would hmm. play piano at Pat's uh, studio on, in the 40s in New York, and Mike was there and Pat. And it was the three of us playing these tunes, and Pat would go, mm, I think that playing, you know, we should make this playing solo section, you know, and we'd make all these decisions. And so, Gil, you'll have to get that ready to print. You know, I went, okay, all right. But I, 
I hardly ever wrote anything down. And Pat said, Gil, are you going to remember this stuff? And, <laughs> oh, I said, oh, yeah, I have a really good memory with this stuff. Don't worry. But he was like, are you sure you're going to remember it? So I said, yeah, I'm going to remember it. Don't worry, Pat. So, um, so then we start to play um, Nearness of You. And they had figured out a key. But I thought he could have sung it based on his range a little bit higher. Yeah. You know, it was like the middle key. So we start, I don't remember even what key it starts in, maybe an F. I, I think that's where it started, an F. But then mm -hmm. for soloing, we went up to G for yeah. Mike. And then Pat said at the end, he goes, but now let's come down to uh, E flat at the end. So I said, all right. So we kind of came up with that shape, you yeah. know, and then I, you Gil, you going to remember that? I went, yeah, I'm going to remember that. So, <laughs> you know, so then I wrote, you know, uh, the, the charts for that, you know, and then the funniest story of that is that, um, when we were recording it, you know, oh, two stories. When we they started recording it, they were playing it about like, you know, they were playing like kind of up tempo. Yeah. And James went, hey, guys, I don't want to hijack your arrangement here, but it's a little fast. He says, I'm having a hard time even getting the, words out he said can we slow it down a little bit and they went oh sure yeah 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 so you know they they we slowed it down and then at the end pat said i think in terms of the arrangement also i don't think we should come back to the figure at the end you know because i think we've heard it enough it's in between and i think we just the nearness of you would we'll just end it there mm. and i was like dang you know i I really was feeling like I really wanted to come back one more time. So they, they're they doing the take, and it looks like that's going to be the take. The nearness of you. And then Herbie just starts to play it. I mean, I don't know if he didn't hear what Pat said mm -hmm. or just felt like, I have to play this, you know. Do, 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 do. And then everybody sneaks in. Yeah. And then James sings the figure. And I said, okay, that's it. You know, I could I could go out and get hit by a truck now. I'm okay. <laughs> I could die now. Mm. I just thought it was so cool. And I, I like went, all right, that's perfect. You know, because, yeah. you know, sometimes as an arranger, your arrangement doesn't quite make it in the form that you hoped it would on the record. And you have no control over it. Mm. But um, unless you produce it. So here it, it was a, a last minute save. Mm -hmm. But if you listen, I mean, that was just like how it happened. It was just Herbie. It's beautiful. Like kind of, I can turn yeah, it on in my head. I have it in there. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, oh, okay. We, weren't gonna, we said we weren't going to do that. But I mean, yeah. how many times do you make a plan when you're recording and then you get to the thing and you go, no, no, that yeah. was not, let's just do it the way it's, we feel like doing it. Mm. So that's another funny story of uh, Mike's record is in Timbuktu. It has like these, these hits, like when it's in C minor, like it had like these little things. And <laughs> Alex Sipiagin said, Hey Gil, why don't we just drop out that figure when Mike is soloing and he'll be like totally free. And then we come back in with the figure, mm. you know? And I, so that was for the second take. And I said, that's a good idea. I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll kind of wave you out when Mike is big. And so we're at the last part and we're building up. And then I go, Phew! and then Mike's playing. And then he looks at me like, <laughs> and 
And he just goes, guys, you're supposed to keep that figure going. Uh, <laughs> I, and I went, sorry, Mike. I thought it would be a good idea if we took it out and then we brought it back in. He goes, no, no. It's, it, I, I want to play off the figure. Yeah, I, I'm good. I'm good with it. So the, the, just leave it in. Let's do another take, guys. Come on. <laughs> and then the other funny story about the Mike session was – I was standing on like a, a milk carton to conduct. I was kind of higher because everybody had like boots, the uh, divider, you know, what do you call the baffles? And yeah. nobody could see me. So I had to stand up, but I was just barely balanced on the thing. And I had my headphones on and I was, I happened to be like going, <clears throat> I was vocalizing the whole time. Nobody could hear it because it was in like a room mic, but and you couldn't hear it. And then Mike said, I don't know when we mix it. Maybe we'll use some room mic or <laughs> or just the direct. And he go, he calls me back and he goes, uh, me and George were just going through some of the mixed stuff to look at it. And uh, we're not going to use any of the room sound <laughs> because you, he says, because you were grunting the entire session. <laughs> <laughs> you were grunting and then he played over the phone like <clears throat> <laughs> he said I don't think that's going to be on the record but you know it didn't sound good anyway Gil honestly the room was kind of mm. it was kind of messy and I don't I don't think we need the room but we can't do it anyway mm. that's funny talking about the other record I see you here also in as part of, right. the, of the you know of the I don't know where you are here. Maybe? Yeah. Right, right. It's part of the rehearsals, watching the rehearsals. And I'm wondering right. what this is like because well, you know Herbie is he's my 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 idol on the piano. So Me too. Me I'm I'm, too. I'm wondering how he's dealing with these uh they're, you know complicated tunes. Um also on the ballads, you know, I'm I'm wondering what the 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 recording process, the the rehearsal process is like, and also then what you bring to the table, uh, right. you know, handling the rehearsal for guys like this. This, right? Yeah, I tried not to be so uh, present, <laughs> but you know, we were at the, at the the rehearsal before the studio, and you know, Herbie admittedly some because. You know, he like does the thing like, man, like Mike, you know, I don't know if I'm going to be able to play this. It's so hard, you know, so he gets himself psyched up, you know, that. And honestly, I had written out kind of Mike's voicings that he was very respectful of, you know. And the first time when he started to play it, you know, he almost played it verbatim to like learn it. You know, he went. You know, he was really like taking it in and making little notes for himself and, you know, and then, you know, he did learn it. And, and even Pat said to me during it, he goes, man, I can't believe how we're, how well we're playing this because it's so hard. He said, and it's really a, a, a tribute to like how you and Mike prepared it for us. Mm. You know, it wasn't that they were good musicians, <laughs> you know, it's, I'm, I'm amazed that we can do so well with this music, you know, as hard as it is. So I was like, well, yeah, you guys are doing pretty good, you know? <laughs> so it was, uh, it was hard and, um, you know, um, and Mike was like, Mike was the rock of Gibraltar, you know, he was, he was this, he was this, he, he never flagged at all. And he was totally, and he hadn't played in about a year. He hadn't mm -hmm. picked up his horn. And then at one point, Pat said, well, I guess this kind of disproves the theory that you have to practice in order to play good. <laughs> right. You know, he said, how does, how's he doing this? You know, it was like, uh, He'd been shedding for days. And then, honestly, Mike said to me, he goes, 
you know, Gil, this is one of the first times that I did a record that I didn't um, that I didn't have some new stuff that I had prepared, you know, that I had some new concepts or ideas or, you know, something that I was excited. It's just my regular stuff. And I, I thought I did pretty good with my stuff. You know, it was wow. like, yeah, you did pretty good with that. You didn't have any new stuff. I noticed that. Yeah. Nothing new. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like, <laughs> wow. You know. Incredible. And, uh, you know, there was, you know, if there was any editing, Steve Rodby said Mike was the metronome. You know, he cut everything to Mike. He was the ah. click track of, uh, of the thing. And, you know, and then amazingly uh steve rodby was was involved in it and he's incredible to have on a record just his oversight and you know perfection um so i was about to go to florida because we go to florida in the winter and we said well we'll reconvene when we come back in january but mike was very sick and uh and steve said Hey, Gil, I think it's a good idea if we get together. There's a couple little things we should really microscope it. And Mike had a couple overdubs he wanted to do on Ewe. We can do that then. And, you know, let's, let's, let's get it, you know, finished up. I think now's the time to do it. And we went, Steve, you are so right. You know, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I, you know, so we met it, you know, Pat and Steve and I. And Mike and uh, we went through it, you know, and you know, we just kind of nitpicked little notes. Mike said, "Ah, oh, that one note in there is a little weird in that line." You know what I mean? I probably shouldn't have played an A flat; it should have been an A. Mm -hmm. da -da -da -da, you know, and we said, "All right, yeah, we can fix that." You know, so that, yeah, that'll be that'll be better. Yeah, 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 perfect. You know, and we did little tiny things. Mike did a overdub on the E week. And um, and that was it. And that was the last time I saw Mike. You know, wow. he died in January, and and then we mixed it without him, which was very hard. Yes, I suppose so. Well, it was not easy. Yeah, and, uh, we were all insecure. You know, like is, is this good? Is this right? Yeah. Is this right? You know, and. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. And even Pat, you know, you know, you would expect Pat goes, this is right. This is perfect. You know, he produced many Mike records, but nobody was sure anymore. You mm -hmm. know, would Mike like this? Is this good? Mm. So. Well, I love the record. It's a great, I think it's a great record. Too. Yeah. So if you, if you spend, um, now going going back to Herbie, if you spend uh, two records like that, and there's another record I think that where you were with him. Um, if you spend time with him, were there moments where you would ask, you know, pick his brain? Oh yeah, a million times, all the time. He would he would pick the brain all the time. Yeah. So can you can you share a little bit? Ah, uh, you know, I just remember. <laughs> Well, here's my the best story about Herbie, honestly, from those sessions. On the first record, we were doing My Ship, and Herbie's, Herbie's such a fan of Gil Evans. Yes. That's his, yeah, he loves Gil Evans, yeah. and he, you know, he, he has his own idea of Gil Evans. And to me, he's one of the best Gil Evans-style writers in yes. the world today. If he could, you know, anything he writes, if it's for three instruments. It's a tribute like, to Gil, Gil, in a way, yeah. It is, totally is. And even his comping, you know, everything yes. is the voicings. coming from mm -hmm. Gil. And Bill Evans, who he's devoutly, he talks about how much he, he loves Bill, you know, and he learned this. from. I asked him once, you know, that thing he does with the pedal, he kind of like goes, boom. Yeah, it's some he does it on the record. So he does? All right. Well, he said, I said, how did you come up with that? He goes, I learned it from Bill. Bill does it. He goes, he does this thing where he stops the pedal and, and I went, 
gee, I never even noticed that. But he he heard something that Bill did a, a bit of, and I don't even know what it is, and I can't do it. And I didn't. I was just like, really? But he he totally gives it up for Bill, you know, wow. and uh, and Gil, and uh, so he said, Gil, do you have the score for that for my ship? And I said, oh, yeah, sure. It's right here. He goes, could I take a look at it? I said, yeah. And so he looks at it. He goes, that's what I thought. It's an it's an um, it's an F sharp in the bass. And you had written an F. And it's the spot where it goes. Ah. And I had written mistakenly. And Herbie heard it, and he went, there's something wrong in that chord. Yeah. You know, so that's how much he knows that. And also, when they played that song on the road for that for that Directions record, and music. Yeah. And I went to a couple of concerts. I'd always know when they were going to play my ship. Whenever Herbie would pull the music, the little music out on the piano, I always knew they were going to play My Ship. Because he, of all the songs that were so complicated, I don't know how they remembered them, these strange arrangements of, you know, sorcerer and complex things. Yeah. And, that, well, oh, that's no problem. But Herbie always wanted to, you know, he wanted to be correct. You yeah. know, and honor Gil. You know, he could deviate in his Herbie way, but he wanted to. I was always amazed by that. You said he, uh, Herbie has his own idea about Gil. Could you elab well, elaborate? You know, everybody has their own ideas about Gil, and hmm. he heard what he heard, and he interprets that as Gil, and he he uses that idea those ideas i don't know exactly what they are but you know he said oh gill used to have you know like that he would have a a weird note in the bass that you wouldn't think wow you can do that on a g minor you put an f sharp you know you know and so that struck herbie and he goes wow you know so mm. that's his You know, and then I think the prisoner and all those. Oh things. yeah, he said also to me in the inter. Maybe the interview isn't in your copy of my book, because I. Oh no, it is. Of course, it is. There's no I Herbie. Did. There's no Herbie interview, and if there oh, would really? be, I would It's need it second. so badly. I okay. would need I'll, it. I'll try to send it to you. Oh Because yes. I did it maybe for the second volume, and then the third volume, I even got Wayne to. to Oh speak. man, I I need yeah. this. I need I'll, this. I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can send it. I think I have it. Um, yeah, I, I can I can photograph it from the book. Oh, that um, would be amazing. But but Herbie said the reason he used the three instruments was because of Gill, because the bass trombone, the alto flute, and the flugelhorn, all three could kind of trade places, and one could be on the top, one could be on the bottom. So he was thinking of that thing like Gil told me about the flute and the trumpet and the soprano. They could be in various, you know, configurations, top to bottom. And it gave a lot of, you know, it wasn't like the lead trumpet, an alto and a, you know, Barry. And they all kind of stick out and they kind of have to be in that order, mm -hmm. you know. Trumpet, alto, Barry, you know, yeah. it's like, blah, 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 blah. it's always the same. You know, you wouldn't want the Barry on top of the trumpet and the alto, you know, but otherwise you can shift things. And so he said that was his tribute to Gil, you know, that mm. he, he learned that from listening to Gil, what, you know, affected him about Gil's music. How is it for you to um, like talk to somebody like Herbie, who is a Gill fan like that? And right. if we that now connect to uh, our mutual friend Mike Gibbs, uh, people like that who have a right. have a have a very very deep understanding of Gill's music, of Gill's um, craft. Sorry. Oh yeah, that's fine. How is it then if you 
if you connect with with people like that who who love his music so much have you learned from from people like mike or herbie who have a different perspective on gill uh, i'm just happy that they have a, i feel much closer to them if they have yeah a perspective on gill i feel like we're you know in the same family yeah and I, you know i wouldn't feel like that necessarily around other piano players that would not be such gill fanatics you know i would feel like you don't really you don't really love Gil I can yeah. tell because you know, Gil had such a you know the funny thing Gil would say to me is when we would play on Monday nights he said you know I'm just kind of a cheerleader I get in there and I like try to cheer people on you know like rah 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 you know <laughs> and he was like he was like you know talking about like you know he liked to he liked to accompany You know, mm. he said to me once, wow, he says, the art of accompaniment is almost dead. You know, on a particularly bad night where nobody was listening or accompanying. And I went, wow, right, accompanying. You can forget about accompanying sometimes, but you really shouldn't. And Gil always thought about accompanying. And there are, you know, so does Herbie, you know. And so did Bill Evans. You right. know, they, they're both like, I'm trying to be orchestral. I always think it's sad that Bill didn't arrange anything. He would have been a great arranger. Yeah, I think so too. That yeah, makes sense. yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it would have, it would have been, a, a, he would have been a shoe in And you know, I got to work with um, Jim Hall yeah. as a piano player, and then Jim hired me to work on some, when he started to ar arrange, he did two records and he actually hired me to conduct and put the orchestra together for, uh, textures, textures, right. Yeah. Those so, are beautiful uh, records. Yeah, it is. I love it. And, yeah. and, and Jim, you know, he, he sounded like Jim when he arranged, you know, and I think it's great that we have that. <laughs> mm. so, Did, did you talk to to Gil about the individualism of Gil Evans? No, not particularly. I, I'm, I don't know individualism so well. That's not one of my huh, Gil okay. records that I know that much. What if you were if you were had to choose one? What's your favorite? What's your go to one that you always? I like the my Gil Gil plus ten Gil Evans yeah. plus ten. I love that one, but. Um, You know, and then the the four with Miles. And What's then, your take on Quiet Nights? You know, that was just they just couldn't finish it. But um, but there are so special sounds on there. Oh, right? I love I mean, those. I love that's those. like yeah. I love this record because it's so unfinished, and there's so too. there there are certain areas that I feel like they couldn't get to on those other records. They they had to do all those other records to yeah. achieve those special sounds, like on Carcovado or oh, I mean, no, Wait I Till know. You See Her. I mean... I know. Well, you know, Wait Till You See Her was pretty much the same arrangement he did for Astrid Gilberto. Right, yeah. And then uh, he just adapted it for Miles. But I, that's another record I love of his. Yeah. So. I forgot what it's called. Uh, look Ask to the Rainbow. Look to the Rainbow. And then the other record that I love is the one he did with Helen Merrill, Dream of You. But and, didn't you work with him on the, well, on the remake? Well, I did the remake, yeah. <laughs> But that was kind of almost embarrassing because somebody had transcribed the, the, the record because they didn't exist and somebody kind of, I think, did it by ear. And they wrote out bass parts for Buster to play rather oh. than chord symbols. And, you know, it was like 40, 50 years later, and everybody was not from the 50s. Yeah. And it was like a little clumsy, you know, including me. And, um, and uh, at one point, I like went, oh, man, this sounds terrible. <laughs> I said, I... 
I wonder what Gil's going to say, you know? Mm -hmm. And then he goes, he kind of like leans back and he goes, hey, guys, um, you know, you, you got to focus and please contribute and your contributions will be appreciated. You know, like, you know what to do, you know, you know how to phrase it and to make it sound good. Please contribute, you know. And the next take, it sounded like a whole nother thing, you know. You know, it was like yeah. they were just they just were not contributing, you know. You know, I've tried to say that, and and uh, people go, mm. "Get it? Though. I'm not contributing to you, no." <laughs> <laughs> but it's hard to pull off if you're not Gil Evans, right? You know? Right. So um. But yeah, the original record though is uh, I That's mean, killing, those yeah. are amazing. Yeah. And then, have you ever heard the thing that what came out called Waterfall? Falling or water, oh man! Falling water. I know. But wow. see, that's where they were. That's where Gill and Miles were trying to go. Why and did somehow, they stop? I, and, I don't know. Maybe they thought it was too out or something there I, I mean there's 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 rec not records but there's um i think they also did a a, a live concert in berkeley in in i think 68 with the quintet and gills uh, orchestra oh i, you, I don't know i love but there, that. yeah there's no recording i oh, haven't no found record. i haven't found a recording yet but they did some live playing also they also the a good thing is the carnegie hall concert they right. did um, Spring is here, which is with the, the only it, Bill Evans, uh, with the Bill Evans kind uh, of, arrangement. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's kind of billish, but it's uh, to me that's one of my favorite Gill arrangements. Yes, you know, and uh, that's the only time it was ever recorded. Yeah, it's 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 just a little bit of a shame that as the sound isn't so good. You know, I think the trumpet is uh, pretty yeah. distorted, but I I love it too. I love it too. Yeah. Honestly, Tio told me that he just kind of went there and recorded it with no um, authorization, just in the event that he thought it would be good. And he went, oh, that was a good concert, guys. Yeah. You know, and then, you know, they played, uh, you know, a sloppy version of concerto. Right. You know, da -da -da. <laughs> you know, it was like it sounded like a rehearsal. But I mean, I love it anyway. And yeah. it's nice to have it. And then if you ever hear a recording of uh, the 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 nonette that did Birth of the Cool, they played at the Royal Roost. Yeah, I have that. Yeah. <clears throat> you have that. Mm. And they, they've listened to uh, Moon Dreams because they completely messed up the ending, which is mm -hmm. very complicated. Da, 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 da. It's very long, and there's all these groups of five. Da, 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 da. You mm -hmm. know, it's all these things. And it completely fell apart. And when I went to Miles' house that day, I brought him Moon Dreams. You know, I, I had thought maybe they would play Moon Dreams, with publicity they played. Yeah. And he looked at it. First Miles looks at it and he goes, That's not Moon Dreams. I said, Yeah it is. Da -de, da -da 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 -da. He went, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but at first he went, That's not Moon Dreams. And then he goes, We can't we're not gonna play that. Oh. He says, Because it floats too much. He knew it was just too hard to play it live, you know, because it's just Unless there's like a conductor there, like, da, da, you know, it's just, it's too, too orchestral. It's almost rubato, you know. I like your version of it. Oh, man. That's what, to me, that was really the first Gil Evans arrangement that I like went. This is unbelievable. And I think I... I got a copy of it from Lou Soloff, who got it from Gunther Schuller, who played on the record. And he said he left the studio last, and they had left all the music there. Ah. Uh. He said they were just going to throw it away. They're like, well, all right, guys, see you tomorrow. See you next week. 
and nobody picked up the music. So if he hadn't picked it up, that would have been the end of the copies of that music. <laughs> so wow. um, he gave a copy to Lou, and Lou gave it to me, and I like went, oh, my God. And Gil had copied all the individual parts, and it says, Miles, oh, Lee, man. yeah, Jerry, you know. And, um, and Gil, I, I don't want to be. I, I would love to have all this stuff. Could you? Would you share? No. No. No, I'm okay. only kidding. <laughs> sure. I mean, you know, that's how I learned it. I'd be happy to share. Everything that you feel like I could be interested oh, yeah, yeah. in. No, don't worry. Don't worry. Just ask me. I have. I have plenty of stuff. You know, I'm. I'm. I'm happy to share. So, I heard once the story that um, Phil Woods asked him to see a copy of Miles Ahead. He said, Gil, I'd love to see Miles Ahead. And Phil said to me, he said, he sent me a pencil score that he did of it. He said, Gil, don't send me the pencil score. You know, <laughs> he said he was so generous. Wow. And the other story about Gil that was kind of sad is – He lived in a place called West Beth, which was like a music building. And Tom Malone, the trombonist, lived in there. And he saw Gil one day go on to the incinerator with a bunch of paper. He said, what are you doing, Gil? He said, I'm burning these old scores of mine. He said, why are you doing that? He goes, because I got to write some new music. I can't write new music with all this music hanging around. Wow. <laughs> so I got to get rid of it so I can think of some new music. Wow. And the last Gil, funny Gil Evans story I'll tell you is that um, he said to me once, he goes, I like playing now, I'll tell you the truth. He says, I'm tired of sitting around trying to find a new way to voice a D minor chord. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think I found all the voicing <laughs> possible for D minor you know well he found wanna, a lot yeah he found a lot and i'm yeah. just i don't want to find any more that's enough let somebody else do that yeah <laughs> okay can we talk about the first track on this album oh yeah yeah okay what's going right. on man this is this is one of the most beautiful pieces of music out there <laughs> it's incredible thank you it's um well Okay. Well, what I I was given for those things, Milton playing an accordion and singing. Ba da di da 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 di da da, and I had to come up with an arrangement for it. So I wrote an introduction. Do, 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 whatever I wrote mm -hmm. and I wrote for contrabass flute I don't know why I thought that would be a good thing and then I, I arranged the song and I tried to conduct to it you know we played the introduction and then okay here's the beginning ba, da, de, I could get the downbeat you know da Da, 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 de, da. You know, mm. it was very hard to conduct, and I was really not a very good conductor at that point of my career. Mm. And the, the funniest story that I remember of that session was I before I went to the session, I said, you know what I think would make me a better conductor? If I had a baton. <laughs> I'm going to go buy a baton. And I, And I went to Manny's music and I bought a baton. And then while I was conducting after, in a little break, I said to Lou Marini, who was playing flute, I said, Hey Lou, is is it better? Am I a better does it look does it look better that I have a baton? Is it help? He goes, Gil, it's like the principle of the lever. He says, Now that you have the baton we can see how bad a conductor you really are. <laughs> it kind of amplifies the how bad, you know, but it was an almost impossible thing to do, to really feel his breaths. And then, then here's the most miraculous story. Then Milton 
recorded that, and then he left the space on the tape, and then he recorded the last section. So I said, well, so we'll do it. We'll do the first part. Then I'll pl we'll play wild the part I wrote for the center part, and then we'll pick up for the end part. That, to me, would be the way we should record it. And they said, well, why don't you just try to conduct and, you know, just keep going, and we'll see if we make it to the end and you play the end then. And I went, what's the chance that what I wrote is going to fit into the space he left, honestly? And they said, well, just try it once. So uh, it was easier to conduct because I could go da 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 fumbling on the accordion like he was going to come in and it was exactly where he came in wow ba -da -da. <laughs> it went unbelievable but he left the space thinking like this is the song ba -da -da -da. and he left that long of a space <laughs> that i filled up with the song in exactly the tempo that he thought of it and then he went off to uh, to um, California to overdub Wayne on it. He, he went on his own, unbeknownst to the company. He just said, I, you know, he just went You also there. didn't know? I didn't know, no. Wow. What did you think when you, I mean, what were you? I was like shocked, you know. I mean, that's was, got to be the one of the most beautiful recordings of, of Wayne also. I mean, how how he plays, how he sounds on there is just incredible. I know, I know. And it was all by ear. You know, he just learned the melody and he just fit into my arrangement like perfectly, you know. And it goes up to like a high E or something. It's like, mm -hmm. Bing! Yeah. you know, it's like. It's crazy how cool it is, but uh, that was a thrill, yeah. Wow. And it was one of the early arranging jobs that um, I had. But yeah, it's but amazing how things come together. It's kind of for me, it's always a miracle if if things come together in a magical way like that, you know, mm -hmm. with the, with the space of the the thing and I go, you know, it's got to be something magical in there. <laughs> <laughs>